Richard, we were just having a brief chat before we put the cameras on, and you said that in 1993 you'd had a, a near-death experience. Well, let's do that on camera. Tell me about it. 1993, I got roped into the first ever attempted crossing of the Taklamakan Desert, which is a huge rugby ball-shaped thing in the middle of Xinjiang province in western China, on the edge of Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. And this was basically a 600-kilometer walk across a desert that had never been completely crossed before, as far as anyone knows. And I got amoebic dysentery, uh, which meant that I couldn't eat or actually really drink anything for some time. So I lost about uh, two stone from a starting point of about sort of eight and a half, um, quite fast. And because we were walking roughly 30, 35 uh, kilometers a day, um, uh, it was quite hard going. And I would have died, I think there's no doubt about that, if it hadn't been for some incredibly powerful antibiotics given to me by the one female on this expedition who was a former army medic. And actually it's her 60th birthday a couple of days ago, so she is the woman who saved my life. So every day must be very precious after mm. that. Mm. Literally, yeah. I think of it as a bonus, every day, yeah. Yeah, in 2010, you decide to go into Parliament. Yes. You, haven't you had enough punishment in 1993? So my younger brother said, is this a moment of madness or a sort of premature male menopause? And, you know, I think moment of madness is part of it. But the other bit of it was trying to use a lifetime of living in different places and doing different things and seeing what I could bring to the city of Gloucester that would be helpful. And I, I felt by then, I thought Parliament and politicians on all sides was in a pretty bad state. And I thought that it'd be good to have more people in there who'd done lots of other things for their first 50 years and could contribute that outside experience rather than being an insider. If you thought it was in a bad state in 2010, how would you describe our politics today? I think it's in a better state, curiously. Um, there are lots of newer MPs. In 2010, there were still a lot of people who'd been around a lot of time. Many of them were bruised or ousted because of the expenses, scandal and so on. I think today's situation is much less about the general group of members of parliament and perhaps more about specific issues. So I, I think it's a different environment. Do you enjoy the chamber, the debates in the chamber, Prime Minister's question time? Sometimes. I mean, you, you ha as you will know so well, you have to sit there for a long time sometimes to get in your sixpence worth. But I think if you go in there with an open mind to listen to the flow of debate and know enough about the subject to be able to pick up on bits that maybe other people haven't raised rather than making the same point or a pre-written question, then I think you hopefully you can contribute something to the, the tone of the debate. Actually, Jack Straw said to me when I came into Parliament, because I knew him from Foreign Office days, but he said to me, take time to find your tone. You know, what do you want to be known as? The grumpy one, the angry one, the feisty one, the calm one? Or, you know, it was good advice, actually. And having spent so much of your life abroad, mm. what has that taught you about... Um, our politics, our country, where our country might go, where it's, what it's getting right, what it needs to do better at? So when I sort of effectively left England in 1979, beginning of 1980, to go and live abroad for the next 20 years, I, I think at that stage the UK was still not very cosmopolitan. And I don't think it was a very tolerant place. I think there were huge gaps in sort of understanding of each other, and we still have those. You know, in my constituency, we still have pockets of the city that are very cosmopolitan, a primary school with 50 different nationalities, and then a mile and a half away, a school that is all completely white and only UK citizens. So there are still places where the fear of the unknown, sometimes on both sides, but often for the people who feel that they've lived there for generations and generations and, quote, newcomers, unquote, are sort of changing the place, I think that is what lies behind a lot of what might be called casual racism, is the fear of the unknown. So one of the things that I always try to do is to make sure as far as possible I spend masses and masses of time with all the different ethnic minorities so that people can see there's nothing unusual about this. This is what we should all be doing. This is what integration is about, is actually having the fun of going to 
Jamaican Independence Day celebrations, actually going around the mosques and talking with the imams, you know, whatever the different cultural things are, throw yourself in because you're always going to learn something new. And immigrants try harder as a general rule. They are the thrivers, the ones with aspiration and ambitions. And you want to have that, actually, because it acts as a spur to everyone else. Do you think people, white working class people, might be offended, though, to, to hear that you, people, that they're not the strivers? Isn't everyone a striver? Yeah, most people are, sure. But sometimes you need a new ingredient. It's rather like if you're having a family lunch or a family supper, sometimes the old sort of jokes and teasing and banter and criticism, you know, sort of slightly dominates. If you throw an outsider into it, you sometimes get a much more interesting, wider discussion that goes on and people sort of slightly moderate their, their sort of behavior to each other because there's an outsider in there. So you all make a bit more of an effort. And, and I think that's what can very often happen. It happens with our white working class, to use your term, uh, rugby communities, when you get um, foreigners who come over and play. It happens when Poles stay and marry local girls, take you know, one example, and, and so on. So places change, they adapt. Interesting to discuss all your thoughts on integration and the benefits of, of integration and newness and um, getting different perspectives in communities. How do you feel about the culture wars? Well, I don't really get involved in them. Because I actually don't think many people really wake up in the morning and think, you know, today's an opportunity to have a, an argument with someone else about culture, a statue, a term, you know, whatever it is. Um, so I think the great thing is, as a general rule, to avoid them like the plague. But we have a statue, for example, in Gloucester, of the Emperor Nerva, a Roman emperor <clears throat> who created the colonia of Glevum, that is now the city of Gloucester. He was a slave trader. We put this statue up about 20 years ago. No one's calling it for it to come down. He was trading our slaves back in, in Rome. So a culture war about a statue and what it symbolizes and what people were doing a long, long, long time ago is as vigorous or as non-existent as people want to make it. And I personally don't think as the sort of voice of Gloucester, there is any reason to go there. We have a history festival that I created in 2011 where we've covered all this sort of stuff with speakers like David Olasuga for years, a long, long time. Down the road in Bristol, the council spent 16 years arguing about what to put on the plaque of Colston. They couldn't agree and people took things into their own hands. That is a failure of political leadership. It doesn't need to go there. Um, you are a campaigning MP and the thing that you're campaigning on at the moment, and we've talked to you on the show about it, is spiking. Mm. Yeah. Why? Because a constituent of mine came to me with her experience of it, and it wasn't just the shock of being spiked by injection on a dance floor in a club just down the road from Gloucester. It was what happened afterwards. It was when she went to the police, when she went to the NHS, the business that actually you need to if you like, be tested very quickly. Otherwise, whatever the chemical involved disappears, so you haven't got any evidence. And that is part of the problem, that people aren't able to sue successfully. Plus, under current legislation, there are two things that are illegal. One is spiking someone for sexual motives, and the second one is the sort of the poison that goes in. Both of those are illegal. But there isn't a specific offence of spiking itself or the intent to spike. So from a police point of view, it's much harder to sort of go on to a dance floor if you're called in and say, right, you were spiking or you were trying to spike. We're going to look at the CCTV and we're going to prosecute. Much harder. So if you talk to students, uh, you know, there's no doubt that there is a lot of spiking that goes on. Some of it in the drinks, if you like the traditional mm -hmm. spiking, and then some of it on the body as well. And both of those, in my view, are unacceptable. It makes life much more frightening for young people, makes going out for a night out much less fun, if you're worrying about this sort of thing. And I think the government should act, and I think the government will act, which is good news. And the act would look like the, the, the act you want to see is what? So the crucial thing is to have an offence of spiking or the intention to spike. So people who are carrying drugs, for example, that they're going to slip into drinks, or carrying a needle that they're going to use on a part of a body, you know, that would be a criminal offence. And, and I think it would have... You know, quite a salutary effect on, on what goes on in the nightlife. Would you need to do random searches to make that work? Uh, possibly. 
And in a way, you could argue some of those should be happening anyway. You also need nightclubs who are going to carry testing kits so that you can get an immediate test. Uh, you need the police and the NHS to work more effectively so that people can go and get instant help. Uh, I suspect you know a, a sort of police nurse would probably be the best place for it if you're reporting it. So there needs to be a whole patchwork of stuff around it to make it meaningful. We're not going to talk about politics because this is not about politics. It's about sort of everything's about politics, but it's about broader themes. So I just wanted to ask you, when a party, and they all go through this, when they, there's a febrile period, what is the psychological impact on MPs? How does it affect you? Psych I'm not asking for your views on whether um, turmoil is correct or otherwise, but does it affect you psychologically? I think it affects everyone in slightly different ways. Um, I think everybody wants to be able to get up in the morning, go to their workplace with the feeling that you are doing something that is valuable, that is considered to be valuable, and that you are all trying your best to make a difference and do things that help your constituents. And if the mood music around all that, for whatever reason is bad and there are either individuals or organizations or parties that are perceived not to be really representing those values, then that's a harder backdrop against which to do your job. No doubt about that, whatever the profession is. You know, I've seen this with policemen after the business of Sarah Everard in London, um, doctors, you know, a long time ago after Dr. Shipman. You know, whenever there's a feeling that your profession has been tainted that's uncomfortable for individuals working it. And you have to keep, I think, saying to yourself and your team, because this is very much a team effort, no MP is, is any better than the sum of all their office, as, as you will remember. Um, you've got to keep saying to them, look, there are some things we can control. And, and the main thing that we can control is what we do and how we help others. What other people are doing, what the mood music out there is, what the gossip, the social media are saying and so on. If, if we spend our whole time looking over our shoulders at everyone else, we're not going to be able to get on with doing the things we want to. So, you know, I run a sort of project list of about 30 things at any given time, and we just relentlessly focus on those and then reacting to all the events, the casualties, the problems, uh, the casework that constantly comes up. And if you can do those two things, as well as some national good causes, that's enough to keep most people's lives busy. Final question. Um, politicians are increasingly subject to abuse and threats. Have you ever been subject to any that worried you? I mean, it's going to sound a bit blase because there are some real threats out there. You know, one of my apprentices started a year or two ago with uh, opening the mail on her first day and the first letter she opened was from a bloke who said, you are an effing Muslim and I will effing blow you up with a nice picture of a man putting a bomb through a window. And she said very politely to my office manager, what should I do with was this she a, letter? Is she a Muslim? No, she wasn't. Right. But there are Muslims who've worked in my office. Right. So, and, and of course, the whole thing was utterly bizarre. And the man has got all sorts of mental health issues. So I think in life, you know, it depends what you've been through. I've had death threats before in different jobs in different countries. I've been in prison in various different countries for, you know, reasons that had nothing to do with me. And you just have to find your own level of comfort. If these things really throw you, and then politics is, is probably not going to be a happy experience. I have to just come back on, you've been in prison? Yeah. 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 I got locked up in Libya in 1977. I was arrested in China in the mid to early 90s. Um, you know, this is what happens when you go traveling in remote places and you arrive on the 10th anniversary of Gaddafi's accession and there's been an instruction to lock up any foreigner who's wandering around. Were you there for pleasure or work? I was in my gap year. I was travelling across the whole of North Africa, yeah. And, and you, you, how long were you in prison? A uh, day and a night. How was that? Uh, it was quite interesting, but, you know, I mean, I didn't sort of come out with a broken leg or anything more than a few bruises, so, you know, good experience, life experience. That's very philosophical. <laughs> Richard Graham, thank you. Thanks.